Welcome everybody to Hofstra University Museum of Art Second Friday. This is, uh, I'd like to introduce myself first. I'm Karen Albert, I'm the director of the museum. I'd just like to ask everybody to, as usual, leave your microphone on mute while we do this part of the presentation. You can certainly make comments and ask questions in the chat anytime during the presentation. And at the end, we'll address any questions that you may have. Uh, I do want to reiterate that this session is being recorded. Um, so this is the uh, part of the series, Romare Beard and Overlapping Meanings, which is a series of five virtual sessions providing an in-depth look at the artist and his work. So in this session, it's our last one, I'm um, going to highlight some of the main points that we made previously and provide you some further information about some questions that people had on the earlier sessions. And there'll be lots of time at the end for any questions or additional in, uh, comments that you'd like to make. I wanna let you know that the first two sessions that were recorded are available on our website and the, the session three and four should be coming up shortly. Um, the link is in our chat if you want the link directly to the web page for where the recorded sessions are. They're on our calendar page right now, um, just so you would know where, where, they, where they are. Okay. So as we talked about in the first session, the Huff University Museum of Art has 27 prints by Romare Bearden. Um, and these include lithographs, screen prints, and engravings. And Bearden manipulated these processes, often combining them and creating new methods in order to create his signature collage look. So that was the look that he was known for, was doing collages. So in, in 2018, we presented an exhibition called Romare Bearden Storyteller that included 22 works from our collection. And we talked about that and so this in the first session that one of our special qualities to our collection is that we have a number of the works, 19 of the prints were gifted to us from the print publisher who worked with Bearded and Rob, Bob Blackburn on the series, The Train and the Family. So we have this very unique aspect to our collection where we have multiple images of the same print. Um, so they had, we have different stages of the process, um, which gives us an insight into how the artist was working. And many of the prints are not the final additioned or numbered version, but are actually unique, ex unique works of art and unique impressions because Romeo Braden did hand coloring and collage on those prints. So that's what kind of makes our collection a little bit special. And this is a little recap of his, his biography, which we talked about also. Um, he was a visual artist, author, and songwriter who drew from his personal experience to illustrate the broader experience of Black Americans, telling stories that connected the past to the 20th century, delving into his personal experiences for insight, and drawing on his deep knowledge of history, literature, and music Beard emerged his artistic expression with his cultural heritage to provide social commentary. One of the things we touched on when we talked about his life is we talked about the Great Migration. So beginning in the early 20th century, there was a mass movement of Black Americans known as the Great Migration from the rural South to the industrialized cities of the Northeast and Midwest, primarily. And often traveling by train, they sought better jobs and living conditions and hopefully a more equal society. You know, they were living in the Jim Crow South. So that was part of why they, they, they mainly re relocated, excuse me, to major cities such as Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and New York, particularly to Harlem. So Bearden's family was part of this relocation. He moved with his family from North Carolina to New York in 1914, settling in Harlem in 1920. And like many who relocated, he and his family traveled back and forth from the North to the South. And for Bearden, the train was an important presence in the rural South because they connected the families and transported people in all different directions. 
So the idea of the train crops up in a number of his work, and it references both the everyday life as trains followed like a regular schedule, and they were consistent, and also larger ideas about migration and segregation. So that gives you some idea of what he was, that his family was part of this whole movement. Um, and the Bearden home in Harlem was a meeting place for many artists and writers that, that of what has become known as the Harlem Renaissance, which arose between the end of World War I and to the mid 1930s. So the Harlem Renaissance witnessed a resurgence of art, dance, literature, and music by Black Americans. It was one of the most significant eras of cultural expression in the nation's history. Although focused in Harlem, it was a cultural explosion that occurred in Cleveland and Los Angeles and many other cities that were shaped by this great migration. So Alan Locke was a Harvard educated writer, critic and teacher who became known as the Dean of the Harlem Renaissance. He described it as a spiritual coming of age in which African Americans transformed social disillusionment to race pride. So the Harlem Renaissance encompassed poetry and pose, prose, painting and sculpture, jazz and swing, opera and dance. What united these diverse art forms was their realistic presentation of what it meant to be Black in America. Uh, what the writer Langston Hughes called an expression of our individual dark skinned selves, as well as a new militancy in asserting their civil and political rights. So this, these are people that, that Robert Bearden knew and they're frequ frequent in his home, was part of his, his uh, formative years growing up in Harlem. Um, the Harlem Renaissance was cut short largely due to the stock market crash in 1929 and the resulting Great Depression, which damaged and stressed African-American owned businesses and publications and made less financial support for the arts available from patrons and foundations and theatrical organizations. So as, as it affected the rest of America, it affected this community also. But most importantly, the Harlem Renaissance instilled in African Americans across the country, a new spirit of self-determination and pride, a new social consciousness and a new commitment to political activism all of which, which provides a foundation for the civil rights movements, 1950s and 1960s. So in doing so, it validated the belief of its founders and leaders like Locke and Hughes, that art could be a vehicle to improve the lives of African-Americans. And this foundation in literature and music and the arts remained with Bearden throughout his lifetime. One of the earlier questions we had from a session was the, was the um, Bearden's relationship with another Black artist, Jacob Lawrence. Um, so, this, so they were contemporaries, um, and the, the two became acquainted in the 1930s, where they met at Charles Austin's 306 st studio, um, which was in Harlem. Both Lawrence and Bearden had taken classes at the Harlem Arts Workshop in the New York Public Library's 135th Street branch, and both were members of the Harlem Artists Guild. Bearden's work was shown at Edith Halpert's Downtown Gallery in 1941 as part of a groundbreaking exhibition, American Negro Art. That exhibition also included Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. So this is Jacob Lawrence's uh, largest body of work, uh, based on the Great Migration. Um, it was 60 panels in total. I'm showing you just three here to give you an idea of what Lawrence's work looks like. Um, and it, these 60 panels on the Migration series depicted different aspects, aspects of that migration. It, it dealt with travel, it dealt with what was the ideal and what was the reality that they found about jobs and housing discrimination. So the image I'm showing you on the left is a, a, a train car, kind of looking at it from above. You see the aisle in the center and the seats on, on left and right. The central image is like an apartment block referring to going from the rural south to the much more heavily populated and industrial north 
a lot of times they were living then in tenements or apartment buildings and complexes like that. So that, that middle image is, a, is an image of the, of the block of the housing. And on the right was as much as they thought they were leaving the South for better conditions, they still faced uh, discrimination and violence uh, and racist policies in the North. So it wasn't all positive. I mean, so that they were, so Lawrence is, and this is, as I said, this is just three of 60 different panels that have different images on them. I tried to show you a little bit of the range of what they were. And a little bit about how Jacob Lawrence's style differs from Romare Bearden's. Um, so these are, if you're interested in this, there's, um, I'll put the, the link in the chat a little bit later. Um, the Lawrence Migration Series is at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. So you can go on their website. They have a whole um, series shown there so that you can see what, you know, the more information about Jacob Lawrence. Because at the time, Jacob Lawrence and Romeo Bearden were probably the two most prominent Black artists in America. So, uh, so one of the other um, other contemporaries of Bearden are um, Charles Alston, Norman Lewis, and Hal Woodruff, were his co-founders of the Spiral Group. Now we talked about this, um, in, I think, in session two. Um, the Spiral Group was a Black artist collective active from 1963 to 65 in New York City and they examined the relationship between art and social activism. The group's name referred to the Archimedean spiral, which moves from a starting point outward in all directions while continuing to move forward. So it was that emphasis on moving forward, right? Um, the group did not have a common artistic style, but rather encouraged experimentation and individu individualistic approaches. One issue they debated was whether a figurative style or a more radical abstraction was more effective to illustrate the Black experience. And although it only existed for a short time, it really encouraged conversations um, about issues of philosophy, creativity, artistic freedom, and they especially addressed the role of, of, art, of the artist's role in social change. And particularly after the march in Washington in 1963, this was something that was very much in the forefront of their minds. Um, so this is, I'm just gonna show you an image from each of the three contemporaries that he developed this with. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Stephanie, do you have a question? No, okay. Um, yeah, Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is Charles Austin, and you can see this is very different. Bearden's work was at the same time period. He was really delving into collage, and it was very, it was he very much was representing things more figuratively. Charles Austin is is taking it a little bit more abstract. Um, he's not relating to it to a specific subject matter that we can see. I see this as kind of a figure, but it's kind of open to your interpretation. He's not really giving us any clue what he's thinking it is. Um, so the, the, so this is Charles Alston, and this is Norman Lewis, who is much more abstract. But to me, I still think of this as people marching. To me, that's the image. That's the, that's the feeling I get from this. But so even though these artists were not. They weren't all working in the same style. A lot of times when artists are considered a group, they have a very similar style and look that they're doing. So that was not part of the spiral group. The spiral group wasn't about doing things that looked the same. It was about individually how we promote Black artists moving forward, right? How we, how we, our individual expression together moves us forward. Um, and this is a uh, one of the murals by Hal Woodruff. His one of the big mural series he did was about was on the Am Amistad mutiny, um, which we talked about a little bit. 
because it was um, the name for the Cinque Gallery that Bearden had started was based on uh, a figure from the Amistad Mutiny, which was a rebellion of enslaved people on board a ship near the coast of Cuba. The mutineers were captured and tried in the United States, resulting in a victory for abolitionists and anti-slavery forces in 1841, when the US Supreme Court freed them and cleared them of all charges. So this is a, this is a series of murals. There's one panel of six. So this is a very much, uh, you know, much more illustrative of the topic. So this is all done, you know, these, these were the artists that were all working kind of together in the same time frame and working on the same issues of black experiences in America, but the visual output that they have is very different, right? So they're not all conforming to a single style. And one of the ways that Bearden was um, very supportive of, of our artists is that we had mentioned uh, when we talked about his biography that his wife, Nanette, was from St. Martin. And they bought a house in St. Martin in the 1970s and spent probably about half the year in St. Martin and half the year in New York at a certain point. So when they were in, in the 1980s in St. Martin, they opened the Nanette Bearden Fine Arts Gallery. And that similar to the Cinque Gallery, which was, a, which was existed in New York City, it focused on supporting local and emerging artists. So it was a place for young artists, and this is an, ex, an example of a work by Raz Mosera, who was one of the, who was a uh, artist from St. Martin, who exhibited at that gallery. Um, so that it, one of the ways that he really gave back was by supporting other artists and being that kind of mentoring figure, not just in, uh, you know, kind of vocally supporting them and, and, but providing a place for them to exhibit, a place for them to gather so that they were able to then move forward. Because a lot of that Bearden's legacy was about moving forward and how do we do that? Um, so when he passed away, uh, they created, he, his widow created the Romare Bearden Foundation in 1990. And the, the purpose of the foundation is to preserve and perpetuate his legacy. Um, and one of the ways they do that is this Cinque Artist Pro Program, which was named after the gallery that I mentioned in the city. And it continued that gallery's legacy in supporting artists through various stages of their career by offering opportunities to engage in conversation and working. So this still exists, this exists now. The, the Bearden Foundation is up and running now. Um, and I left the, the website there if you wanted to find out more about what they do. But in addition to preserving Bearden's legacy by promoting exhibitions, symposia, and research in his work, they also assist younger Black artists with getting the same kind of support. So it's a, so that, that idea for Bearden, that was very important, that it wasn't just about his own uh, trajectory as an artist, but about bringing everybody, you know, reaching that hand back and bringing people up with him. That was part of what, of what he uh, was doing. And a, and a lot of times when you start reading about an artist, you'll, you'll hear, um, You'll read something that's a kind of a negative comment or something. I have to say, everything I've ever read about Romare Bearden said about what a warm and generous and giving person he was and how he truly believed that that was the way to, to move forward was by helping the next person come up. I mean, that was very much what he believed in. So we spoke a lot in, an early, in the earlier session, in session two, about who and what influenced Bearden's imagery and his work. So I'm just going to give you a few uh, examples of very many of people who were influenced by Bearden, right? So the other way around. So who did he have an effect on? Um, so August Wilson first encountered Bearden's work in the late 1970s and was immediately entranced. Uh, August Wilson is a playwright, if I didn't say that first. Um, he said that Bearden's work depicted Black life presented on its own terms, on a grand and epic scale, 
with all its richness and fullness in a language that was vibrant and which made attentive to every day of a life, ennobled it, affirmed its value, and exalted its presence. He declared that in Bearden, I found my artistic mentor and sought to make my plays the equal of his canvases. So this is a playwright, a writer, who's looking at Bearden's work and saying, he's doing in, in his visual art what I want to do with my plays. So that's very strong. Now this, this is a lithograph um, that's based on a collage titled The Piano Lesson. Uh, that was done in the, the collage was done in 1983 and it's one of many works that Bearden did based on themes of music and memory that was a common theme that translated worked with worked through his work in his work um, so Bearden translated this collage into a 24 color lithograph which emphasized his bold use of color so lithography, if you were with us on session three, we did the, we did the print demonstration from the uh, Blackburn uh, printmaking workshop. Um, and that the, we, the, what we saw was a lithograph in one color, right? This is a lithograph in 24 colors. So this is a process where the artist draws with a greasy crayon or paints with a liquid touche directly on a stone or a plate. So it captures the hand of the artist. This print was commissioned um, by uh, the Nanette Beard and Dance Theater in honor of Mary Lou Williams, who was a jazz pianist and composer. So in this image, we see the piano teacher hovering closely over the student, intimately involved in the lesson. So this image became the inspiration for the Pulitzer Prize winning play by August Wilson called The Piano Lesson. So here we have Bearden's visual work directly influence another work in another media, which is really, I think, just really fantastic that this kind of connection happens here, right? So another person who was influenced by Bearden is Brandon Marsalis. So jazz musicians frequently inspired and been, had been inspired by visual artists and it was, um, but this is really a very special interchange uh, between Marsalis looking at Bearden's work. So this is an album called Romare Bearden Revealed. And it was comprised uh, entirely of newly recorded music produced by saxophonist Brandon Marsalis in celebration of the art of Romare Bearden, which is a major retrospective exhibition that opened at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 2003. So uh, Romare Bearden Revealed is a recording that reflects Branford's view as, of Bearden as adventurous. His work reflects a world of tradition, but also the will to break tradition. So now we have a musician who's been inspired by, by looking at Bearden's work. I think it's really, I think that kind of goes to the, the importance of Bearden's legacy, not just the visual arts, but to other arts also. Um, and this was a, you know, very special, special recording for that uh, exhibition at the retrospective at the National Gallery of Art, so. And then uh, this is a work by Faith Ringgold who some of you may know, she's known for her story quilts, um, which basically, very similarly to Bearden, she's telling a story about her about Black America. It's really what she's doing. Um, so she also, at a young age, received encouragement from Bearden. Um, after Faith was rejected by a New York City gallerist, Ruth White, in 1963 to not be represented, she wrote to Bearden, hoping to join the spiral group. And while Bearden did not invite her to be a member of the collective, he did write back that he enjoyed her slides, adding, don't despair, just continue to work hard. And she did. So similarly to Bearden, she feels it's her job to tell her story. As she says, your story has to come out of your life, your environment, who you are where you are from. 
So this is the, I chose this particular quilt because I think we can definitely see how it relates. We looked um, last time at Romer Bearden's uh, collage of the block, you know, the city street in uh, Harlem. And this is called Street Story Quilt. I think there's a lot of similarities in showing, showing yes, the neighborhood, this, the, the facades of the buildings, but then going in and showing what's happening in those buildings, who lives there, what's, what's happening on a daily basis. And that, that idea that you are drawing from your own experience and talking about what you see as, you know, what's, what's important to you in your life and what the people you see and relating that story about the people that very much, she has a very much similar uh, with Bearden. So then uh, in the first session, someone had asked about the Bearden, Hofstra's connection to Bearden or Bearden's connection to Hofstra, I should say. Um, so, I, so I did find out that um, in 1982, he was awarded an honorary degree from Hofstra. And that would have meant that he spoke at that time. In 1984, he designed the 20th anniversary poster for the NOAA program. And the, the NOAA program is the New Opportunities at Hofstra Scholars Program. Um, has, provided, has provided highly motivated and diverse students with access to higher education since the program's inception in 1964. The NOAA Scholars Program continues to provide academic, financial, and social support resources for students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who attend Hofstra University. The students are required to complete a free five-week pre-freshman summer ac academy prior to entering Hofstra in the fall. And this serves as a foundation for their success at Hofstra. Um, and so the scholars receive ongoing academic support, financial aid, and educational enrichment opportunities throughout their time at Hofstra. They often sometimes come to the museum for special events. We've done special tours for them also. So this was something, again, I think um, that Bearden would design this poster for the 20th anniversary of a program that he's then, you know, kind of, again, spreading his name and his importance to others and to keep it going. So that's my kind of recap for the for the Beard and series. I want to thank everybody who 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 came came to uh, the sessions. As I said, if you missed the earlier sessions, session one and two are available on our website, and the link is in the chat. Sessions three and four will be coming shortly. It's a matter of we have to. Uh, edit and transcribe that before we can post them to the Hofstra website for accessibility reasons. Um, I do want to say that we have in-person exhibitions that are coming up. I mean, excuse me, in-person events that are coming up. Um, we have a, a round, trade, round table called Drawing Across Disciplines next Wednesday. We have Slow Art Day on April 2nd. We have African Art in Context in conjunction with our uh, Art of the Dogon exhibition on April 6th. And we have a Preserving Visual Cultural Sherman Art Conservation Lecture on April 20th. Those are all listed on our calendar page. So if you want details about that, you can certainly go, you know, go there. Um, so now anybody, you know, like, like open it up for some questions or comments. Um, hopefully I'll be able to to um, answer. I see Gloria Katz has her hand up, but we do have a message. Why don't we sit tight for Gloria for a second? Um, we do have a few messages in the chat. Okay. And the first one from Ron Jansen, um, does the St. Martin's Gallery still exist? No, it does not. It closed. Um, I couldn't find the actual date that it closed, but it does not still exist. Okay. Um, Another question is also um, from Ron: Is date of the twentieth anniversary of NOAA? Oh, it was 1984. Okay. It started in NOAA started in 1964, and it was 1984 was the date of the poster. Okay, um, and then Glory, I think it was Gloria. She has yes. her hand up. So if you want to just turn your microphone on, Gloria, you can go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'm struck 
by the tremendous use of primary colors, both by Bearden and Lawrence. Um, I, I see it as a reflection of the optimism or, or encouragement, but you know, the subjects that they are dealing with are, are so harsh and dark, and yet they choose to use these bright primary colors in, in their work. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, you know, that's their artistic choice. I mean, I don't, um, some of Bearden's aren't as bright. I mean, it depends on, on what ones you're looking at, but I don't, I mean, part of their, for both Lawrence and Bearden, it was a lot about um, depicting what they felt was everyday, normal African-American life and how, um, the, the normal things that you would do, you know, you travel to family, you do, you know, you, you, you celebrate holidays, you, you know, a lot of them have, um, the particular ones I showed you did not have this, but they often have, um, like the, they depict like Easter Sunday and things like that. So it's not all dark imagery. Um, and I think that part of it is they also, you know, they, they're, 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 they're artists, they're using their color palette the way they feel is the most best way to express it. I hope that answers or gives you, gives you some thought anyway. So. Yeah, well, it just seems that they had a very positive uh, outlook rather than emphasizing the, the darker colors, the browns, the blacks, yeah. the grays. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think they both thought that what they were doing was trying to um, you know, from the uh, Harlem Renaissance on, trying to make, um, I don't know how, the, how to say this the best way, um, the idea that they're a community, and it was a way of showing that this, this community has, you know, the, the, the Harlem Renaissance was all about the, the artistic and cultural expression from this community. And I think drawing on that idea that we're using this and we, we want to, we don't want you to see us, this is how we see ourselves. Right. And we're going to move forward from this. So, we're a vibrant community and yeah. therefore and the it, colors reflect that. Yeah. That, that yes, that this is how they see their own community, and this is their own story that they're moving forward with. And it, it's not always positive, but I think in general yeah. it was pretty positive. Their 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 work is tended to be positive, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gloria. Think, Sasha, did we have? I think we. I just want to check. We've had a couple of questions about the links and I did, I did just repost the link to our calendar page. So when you go to our calendar page, you may just have to scroll down a little bit. Like the first thing that may come up, may come up is like, you might just see drawing matters, but just go ahead and scroll down and then you'll see where you can, um, you know, click onto those videos. So I did yeah. just repost that. And I okay. think we may have another question. Uh, hold on. Someone had just, oh, Delinda added, primary colors are building blocks for all other colors. Is it possible that this went into their philosophy of moving forward? And she's commenting like this is it's very interesting. And I thought so too, thoughtful um, observation by Gloria about it's like heavy content, but the colors are so bright. Well, I mean, I, I think for sure. I mean, obviously the, the primary colors are what are definitely what every, every color is based on. I don't think that's, um, I think that's a good observation. Um, I think it's, you know, it's also, I don't think they necessarily wanted it. I don't think every image they did was uh, like kind of dark or, or down. So I think it's, you know, they are talking, they are talking about moving forward about, you know, I mean, a lot of this work was done. Um, a lot of their work was done during the, era, uh, you know, up to civil rights and through the civil rights movement. So a lot of it was about, this is how we see ourselves. This is how we're moving forward. Um, 
in our collection, we also have a print by Jacob Lawrence called um, Confrontation at the Bridge, which I, I don't, I could eventually find for you, but uh, it is actually a, an image of the march over the bridge in Selma, and it is primary colors. And I think that sometimes they do that because primary colors often they what is it? They like activate each other, and they make uh, they make the, each other kind of pop, and they give a sense of um, intensity or movement sometimes. So I think that sometimes they're using those colors to kind of make you have a little bit more of a, a reaction to it. If it was all dark, it might be different. Does that make sense? So. Anything else, Sasha? Yes, I was okay. trying. To, I was trying to find that image to post it. So sorry. okay. Um, someone, Elizabeth asks, "Will the drawing roundtable be offered on Zoom?" No, it's not. It's it's in person event. This is our last virtual program for for this semester. And um, and Linda comments the original name for Noah. The NOAA program was Negro Opportunities at Hofstra, and then later changed the Opportunities at Hofstra, and she worked there. She worked at the Nassau County Commission, excuse me, not there, but she worked for the right. Nassau County Commission for Human Rights for 35 years. So thank oh. you. Thank you well, for giving I us- I didn't know that. I, I've, only, I've only ever seen it as new opportunities. At I know it from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Charmise comments on can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. comments, that's a very powerful piece of work, speaks to a vibrant history um, with difficult realities. Yeah. You know? So she's talking about that. I I'm still trying to get a link for the Jacob Warren's piece in our collection. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. then and then Ron Jansen adds adds Bees, you know, Bearden's wife seems quite interesting. Did she work in visual arts as well as dance? Um, as far as I know, she did not, but she definitely, they definitely were a, a long-term couple, definitely were involved in each other's work. I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know her, I don't know that she's an artist, that never has come up, a visual artist, but she definitely was, mm. you know, they were very involved with all the arts, I think, as we can see, yeah. Okay, and I just tried to post that image. I'm hoping that everyone can open that as a JPEG. I'm not sure if that um, okay. translated well, but I did try. I, th I think we, a, a lot of thank yous, a lot of, um, you know, great program and, and mm -hmm. so thankful um, and that for the program. And excuse me, Jane Levinson says, yeah. I have a thought on the brightness in what we, in what we might not think so much. So I'm so she has her hand up. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you want to expand on that, please. You can unmute yourself. There you go. I was thinking, um, particularly when you showed us that block picture, I think, another yeah. time, and you had the photo that was black, white, gray, and then you had the vibrant storyline, that sometimes we can become so sophisticated that we think the simple joys of life, even in a poor place, aren't so joyful. I think he was sharing, in part, life. Yeah, I've seen it as I walk down from the Metro North Station down into maybe the Upper East Side. And I've had people say, you walk there and this and that. And I've said, oh, yes, people are having little parties in the yards and here and there. They don't look unhappy. Yeah. Um, maybe we are the ones, not all of us. I mean, that sometime we get ourselves too sophisticated and miss many of the joys that really are also happening. And so I felt maybe in part there was something to do there. Yeah. In particular, something like the block, I think Bearden was very much trying to show all aspects of life on the block. Yeah. Not, not that it was a, a downtrodden place at all, but this was home. And this was, you know, there are family gatherings, there's people meeting on the street, there's businesses. Yeah. I mean, I think very much that idea that this is our community and, and all these things happen there. Um, the block is not, I mean, depends. I think that 
that's a, a well, it's, a, it's an amazing piece, especially if you look at all the details on it. But mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times he, a lot of times you're using those, the colors are really, you know, as an artist, they're really deciding their own color palette, whether they decide to do something darker or brighter. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it may be that's the way they're feeling when they see this. I mean, it, it, it's a very intuitive kind of thing when an artist chooses the color. Um, it could do with their own feeling. It could do with what they're seeing. I mean, so I think there's a lot of interpretations we can make. I don't, I mean, I think, I don't think either one of them, Jacob Lawrence or Romare Bearden were, had a negative outlook about their future. I think they were, they were very much positive, realistic, maybe about some of the things they weren't, they weren't, you know, they didn't have rose colored glasses on. They realized that their, you know, things were not everything was not okay, but um, they definitely, I think, had a positive viewpoint. Oh, and Charmise has a hand up. Yes. Um, Go ahead, Charmise. Oh. So um, what I was going to say is a lot of times I've seen um, in looking at different artwork, um, even being in both galleries at different times, you know, when it shows a lot of um, historical things that may um, show a reality that's tough to digest, um, the other thought, as you look at it, is to think that um, those that have to deal with that as their reality and in the trenches have to find a way to have a glimmer of hope. And it may, right. may then resonate with them as something to be proud of and just, you know, proud of where they are for the time mm -hmm. being and more hope for the future rather than just seeing the darkness. So I feel like the colors brought vibrancy um, whenever I looked at them and different mm -hmm. artwork um, that has primary colors and things because it you know, um, or else they may have been succumbed to uh, constant depression if they didn't yeah. find something to look at that would still make them have hope, you know, and yeah. just kind of pass that on, although that's not the end of the story for, you know, their life and their situation at the time, because, you know, you're talking about a time period when there was constant oppression and, right. you know, fear of death and things like that. And, you know, even looking back at this, this you have that dual mode where they were still right. positive enough to press forward, you know, to help right. those around them. So thank you for sharing that always, Museum. You're welcome, Charmise. Um, yeah. I think that very, very much what Charmise is saying, you know, Beard and, and, and Lawrence too, this was, they were showing from their perspective, their community. So it's not all negative. Even, even when you go to, um, in Lawrence's migration series, I showed you three. There's 60 panels. There are, there are some that are there are some that are very positive. It's not all negative. So I mean, the, there was that. That was the reality. Is that and with anybody's life, right? There's positive and negative. There's things that are that you're happy about and things that you're not. And you know that they. I don't think that they were necessarily heavily focused on one or the other. Um, I do think that they both were. Um, we're looking at it as, you know, we're building towards something. We want to progress forward. I, I would like to say something. Yeah. I really appreciated um, this. And those pictures of the, the, the street uh, and the bright colors, uh, to me, showed the people themselves enjoying whatever it is that they had. Mm -hmm. Having Having been brought up in the city, um, in, in Brooklyn, as opposed to, you know, the Bronx, we enjoyed what we had. And I think that that's what he was expressing mm -hmm. with those bright colors. It was very cheerful and, and hopeful. Um, and, um, you know, no matter what, we have our community. Yeah. And um, I, I, I really enjoyed looking at those yeah. and, and feeling uh, a, a part of the community. Mm -hmm. Well, not I, think, to, I, yeah, think not very, to, I think that's very true, yes. Not to be crass, but you know, it's also much more saleable when it is something that you can live with for a long time that is not depressing and and dark um, mm -hmm. and dismal but 
yeah, cause, yeah. I, I think that they, I think that both of these artists were trying to show from their own perspective how they saw their community. And I did think, I do think they were, they saw that joy in their community. Yeah. They yeah. saw the positives too. So yeah. it's not, yeah. So, well, they didn't ignore the things that were negative. They definitely were trying to get to show as, as black artists looking at their own community, what they saw. Yes. Okay. So I think, I think that's definitely what they were doing. And Faith Ringgold says it too. I'm telling my story, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm saying what I, what I feel, what I see. So that it, you know, it's, it's kind of personal in that sense that it's what their own experience is. I, if I can just add too, I think it's also powerful and, and underscores their intention that it's so relatable. Right, mm -hmm. they can look at their work, and you can draw connections, and it kind of shows that that universal connection that, like you're saying, people have with community and experience, and and that's powerful that that they put themselves out there, and their art is deeply personal, but shows us how connected we are. You know, we we all have similar stories, um, kind of, you know, one way or another, and and. And art does that, right? It communicates right. those yeah. stories like instantly, without any words. You can look at a picture and and understand a person, and and their maybe a little bit about their identity, and it creates common ground. Um, Ron Jansen puts a quote with uh, Zora. Oh, Ron, did you want to add that yourself? Yeah, I might as well. Sure, uh, yes, please do. Please do. <laughs> yeah, thanks. In, in a more general way. Um, than what you're talking about specifically these artists. I wanted to re remember that the writer Zora Neale Hurston mm -hmm. um, yeah. talked about the importance of laughter among black people and what a great quality it was of their life and that the basic happiness of their lives um, you can constantly see on the faces of black people in spite of all the difficulties they've been through um, in life. So so this happiness and this, this laughter and this positive mood is also um, not just a personal thing of these artists, mm -hmm. but it seems to be a kind of, you know, cultural quality that some writers talk about. Yeah. That there's, and there's a lot more, um, going back to the Harlem Renaissance connection, there's so much more information about the Harlem Renaissance and how important that was mm -hmm. in kind of gathering this community, this arts community that was visual arts, you know, music, writing, um, all, you know, everything you can imagine, you know, this, this group of s such a talented people coming together and being proud of their community and having an outlet for this expression. And it really, I think, kind of becomes a foundation in these different cities, because we talk about Harlem Renaissance be uh, being in Harlem, but there were other kind of, right. uh, you know, a cultural e expressions in other cities, too. It kind of got the name from Harlem. But you know, because it, it included not just the entertainment, but there were black businesses, you know, there were black theaters, there were black, there was publishing house. I mean, there's, there's a whole, you know, industry that gets created from this um, that kind of, I think, kind of sets some of the foundation for what happens later. Mm. So, and I think that, you know, and Bearden growing up in this, in, in this community, um, would have felt that support. And I think that maybe that's part of the reason why he felt that he needed to then support other people. So my, my interpretation anyway. Elizabeth? Yes, I wanted to say that, um, you know, it, art is, is something that is, of course, remembering what yeah. went on during yeah. that time. And the colors are joyful. And it lets you know that even though they were going through hard times, there was still joy. Mm -hmm. There was joy in the community. And also a reminder for the coming generations that yes, you know, we might be having these problems now. We might be going through these things, but there was a time when we were celebrated, when, you know, every, you know, we had, like you said, the Renaissance and mm -hmm. uh, it was a wonderful time. And so you can't, since it's in pictures, uh, in videos and things like that, uh, you can't take that away from us. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's what I feel art is about. Yeah. Uh, remembering a time, a space, remember uh, of things that happened so that people can't forget. Yeah, thank you. I think it also goes to kind of 
the a universal quality of being human, right? We all want community. We all want those relationships. And that's what kind of grounds us. And, you know, those are the things we think about. I mean, especially in the last couple years with the pandemic, how many people have said, I just want to be with my family. I want to see my friends again. I need those people with me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that Bearden in particular was very much about not just, yes, this was him as a Black artist showing his community, but he also said, this is about humanity. This is about everybody. And, you know, kind of getting that idea that it's not separate so much as we're all part of this human community. Um, and I think when we showed the... Um, and we showed the Odysseus suite, the 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 uh, the, the stories from Homer's Iliad. Um, that idea that this is a Greek hero that Bearden has now made a black man, and what his struggles are, and what his challenges are, and how he makes his way home, you know, through temptations and through all kinds of challenges and things he has to overcome, and that idea that, you know. It could be anybody, you know, we're all, we all go through these challenges and struggles and, and his, in that sense, making our way home. But so there is a, a counterpoint to this, of course, is someone like James Baldwin, who certainly didn't have that uh, outlook on life. So, you know, there is the yin and the yang. Yeah. Hello. I wanted to ask about uh, that print, uh, the block. Uh, the comment was that there was no perspective. Uh, but if you look at the far left corner, you have the angle of the street going down in the back. Uh, and also the way that the sidewalks are placed creates a sense of uh, depth also. Yeah, I think that what, um when we're talking about the block, there's a specific artistic um, way of drawing deep perspective, right? We have a point okay. on the horizon and all the lines go back to it. And it's a very traditional way of drawing depth. Bearden didn't use that. He does show you some depth. It's not that it's 100% flat, but it's not, it's, not, it's not traditionally drawn in perspective the way things, you know, the way a traditional perspective would be. It does show you some depth. It does show you down the street. I mean, and it does show you the, the sidewalk kind of, you know, coming forward a little bit so you can see it. So there's- It also changes the scale. Yeah. Things in the distance uh, to create depth. Yeah. 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 And I think one thing to consider is that Lawrence and, and Bearden, they're working in a deeply modern way. You know, they're, yes. they're influenced by, you know, post-World War II artists, flattening the space. Again, the departure from like academic styles, um, traditional perspective, and they're, they're showing you their world in a deeply modern way. And it, kind of, and, and it speaks to their experiences. You know, they're living in a different world too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're both showing, they, they both show you a repre the representational subject that there's a subject matter. There's a figure, you can see that, but it's treated in a very, you know, with some very modern ideas about space and color. So they're kind of in that, you know, they're not, it, they're not painting or working in a very traditional format, but they are still realistic. There's still, you know, a figurative work in the, that you can see the figure and those kinds of things. But. Sasha, any, any other? Well, just if you haven't had a chance to kind of scroll through the chat, um, I would do that. There's just some really nice comments, of, you know, about people's experience and thoughts. I did post the Jacob Lawrence Phillips collection. Oh, thank you. I put that in there. And then there is also a comment um, that the Migration Series, and it is jointly owned, right? So the collection um, 30 are in the Phillips collection. I, I, I kind of remember reading this myself. And yeah. The, MoMA. the, the um, web... They're all shown on that website. On that though, link, I think. exactly. Yes, I looked yeah, at that. Yeah, I think that. so. I was, yeah, I was going to say you can kind of see them collectively yeah. all on that link, and I I posted that again yeah. in the chat. So okay, yeah. So thank you to everyone for for your wonderful comments. They're really nice yes, to read. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, this is the last. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we have. We, as I said, we we 
we we wanted to continue to do some virtual programming, but um, we we most of our rest of our program for the semester is in person. So if you can join us, that would be great. They're all on that calendar page. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm glad that you you enjoyed it and that we've had a really great response to the series. Um, we will be sending to your email a little uh, survey probably in a week or so. If you could fill it out, just give us, you know, some basic information so that we kind of have a little bit of an evaluation to help us we appreciate your feedback so we can work on programs, you know, coming up. Um, and, you know, if you have any other questions, you can certainly um, let us know. Um, I think it is a brilliant series, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And so welcome because we were so limited in having access right. to museums in person. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Really That's grateful. Why we hope you'll do more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we'll we'll see if we if we're able to do more. We're we're kind of we've kind of we've kind of scheduled through May, and we haven't really got past that yet. We have to kind of reevaluate how we're doing and, and what we can do, so. I just wanna tell you, I thought it was fascinating to see the, the uh, relationship to August Wilson because mm -hmm. I'm an, a theater person and I've seen uh -huh. almost all of his shows mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. they even look similar to me. <laughs> looking, you know, August Wilson and Bearden. Take yeah. a look and see. I, I think that, you know, I think that's one of those things is we tend to separate artists you know we have visual artists over here and we have writers over here we have musicians over here but especially with the Harlem Renaissance they were all interacting all the time so and I, I met that somebody kind of, who was a, um, a part of the group an older man obviously is older because he's still alive uh, several years ago I went to a wedding in Maine and he was part of the Renaissance he wrote children's books mm -hmm. and you probably would know who he is but I can't remember <laughs> at this point but it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So thank you so much. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, just a quick question from Anne-Marie. Uh, where are the other 40 panels in the migration series? I thought that there were a hundred. Oh. Uh, I thought they were six. I'll have to, hmm. hmm. Uh, I'll have to look that up, Anne-Marie, because I, 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 I thought that, yeah. I thought that I had done that, but if you're saying you think it's different, I'll, I'll look it up and I can email you. Because I have, I have 60, yeah. I know it's jointly I owned. Be, it could be wrong, too. Um, it, maybe it is just 60. I thought I read somewhere it was 100, but... Yeah, I, well, I'll look it up. We'll figure it out. Yeah, Thank you. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. I hope I'm, I'm glad to hear that so many of you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll look to do something in the future. Great. Thank, thank you, you so again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Series. I'm glad you enjoyed well. it. It's total response is great. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Good to see you virtually. <laughs> Give you a little shout out. You're muted. I can't hear you, though. Better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful. Fantastic. Right, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Always. Thanks. So good to see you. You too. You too. Well, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off now. Thank you, everybody.